Hello, Cleveland Youth Orchestra. I'm Rena Esmail, and I'm the composer of She Will Transform You. Um, thank you so much for your thoughtful questions, which I have up here. I'm just gonna dive right in. So the first question comes from Jade, and it is, what is your favorite part about composing music and why do you compose? So I think for me, what I love about composing is that I get to create this environment where people can communicate with each other in different ways. And I can kind of decide how I want people to communicate with one another. Um, and so I think my favorite part of the composition process is actually the rehearsal process. So before that, I'm just by myself in my studio, like I am now, um, just writing dots on a piece of paper and trying to envision what people are gonna do when they see those dots and lines. and. By the time it gets to the performance, you know, it's already there and it's already uh, completely done. But a lot of the real work and a lot of the real feedback I get is from the rehearsal process, whether it's um, a premiere where I've never heard the piece before, or whether it's just a rehearsal of a piece that already exists, but maybe I'm hearing people play it for the first time, or maybe I'm hearing people who have played it many times continue to kind of grow with the piece. Um, but I love interacting with musicians and I love hearing them interact with my ideas and really um, next question, what's your favorite instrument or group of instruments to write for? So this is a really tough question because um, every instrument has its own world of possibility. I will say that there are some instruments that I maybe can think a little bit further into. You know, I am I was trained as a pianist. I was also trained as, um, I have some training in Indian classical music, Indian classical voice. Um, and then I've also had some string instrument training. So I can play the violin like moderately well and the guitar, you know, a little bit. Um, so, with instruments that I can play, I have a really tactile sense of what they can do, and I think I can push them in different ways. But then, for example, on the other hand, I just finished writing a trombone sonata, and it was so cool to write a piece for an instrument that I have never played, and I don't even know what the sensation is of someone. I can't, I, there's no way I could probably even make a sound out of a trombone if I tried. So it's really amazing to figure out what my compositional voice sounds like for instruments that I really don't play. So for me, I love writing for instruments where I can learn something new, whether that's diving into an instrument I've already you know, written a lot for, like the violin, for example, or um, really trying an instrument for the first time, like the trombone or the harp, which I've written for in orchestral settings, but just this year have written for um, in solo settings. All right, uh, next question from Autumn. Have you traveled internationally to perform your music compositions? Yes, I actually have. Um, I've traveled to a number of places, but I would say my absolute favorite time that I've traveled for my music is when I took my oratorio, This Love Between Us, on tour to India. So this is a piece for um, a choir, uh, orchestra, and Indian soloists, so sitar and tabla player. Um, and it was commissioned by uh, Yale and Juilliard, co-commissioned, and then they had a uh, sitar and tabla player from India perform. It's a 40 minute long, like, massive piece. And so we took it on, uh, we played it in America and then took it on tour to India. And it was really cool to see how Indian audiences perceived this piece because it's written in using Indian ragas, some of them, some of the movements, and um, they really picked up on very different things um, than a Western audience would. Uh, yeah, it was, it was super cool. All right, uh, next question. When composing for chorus, where do you find your texts? This is maybe one of the hardest questions, and I'm glad that um, that this, this was asked. I think, uh, oh, I don't know who asked it, but in any case, whoever asked it, it that, that was a great question. Um, it's really hard to find good texts. At least I find that it's very difficult because a lot of the texts that I love are by poets where maybe they're living, maybe they're recently deceased, but their work is still in copyright, which means that you have to go through a publisher and get rights. And not everyone wants their, their words set to music. So sometimes you just fall deeply in love with the poem and you love it so much. And then you realize that for some reason you can't get the rights to set it. So for that reason, um, 
Sometimes I end up setting very old poetry. Like I've recently been working with um, a poet from many centuries ago, uh, Kabir, who is um, an Indian saint poet. He's uh, like a historical figure. Um, and then on the other hand, I sometimes work with living poets who I actually uh, write work with. So I'm working right now with this incredible poet named Rebecca Gale Howell, who is based in Lexington, Kentucky. And she and I are working on some big projects together. And, you know, you'll see many of my works have, have her poetry that she's written specifically for um, that work. Um, but on the other hand, and this is a question that Laura asked, why did you choose the poem by Nilanjana Banerjee as the text for She Will Transform You? And where did you first come across that poem? So it was really interesting because this was a situation where um, the thing that I had I just, just mentioned happened where I fell in love with a poem that, that I really, really loved. And then I realized I couldn't get the rights for it. I couldn't get in touch with the, the management of the, the person whose poem I wanted to set. And so I was really wondering what to do um, and how I was gonna handle it. And it turned out I was actually at another performance of this piece, this love between us that I mentioned before that we took on tour to India. And I was talking to the tabla player, this Indian drum player, and I was saying, oh, I'm writing this piece, uh, I'm writing this commission, and I can't find a text, and I don't know what to do. And I knew that his wife was a writer, but I didn't realize that she was a poet. She's she's known more for, for longer form writing. And um, his wife is Nilanjana Banerjee. And he said, you know, she might have something. Why don't we Why don't we see? And so I got in touch with Nila, and she. it turned out that she had some poetry, and one of them was a, a a little bit of a longer version of this piece. And so um, when I saw it, I really immediately fell in love with it and thought, oh, this is perfect. This is the perfect sentiment. Um, and it spoke to me on so many levels, but also because I am a child of immigrants. So I can imagine what this mother in the poem is talking about, the idea that she's come to this country, she kind of belongs nowhere and everywhere at the same time, but her child has the ability to, to because they can see the kind of the beauty in both cultures, they can transform the world around them. And um, th there is a bit of kind of nostalgia imagining my parents coming as immigrants to this country and thinking, well, we're raising our child in an environment that we didn't grow up in, and yet maybe she can do something really um, interesting in the world because of her multiple perspectives. And so, um, it resonated for me a lot, and I'm sure it resonates with so many other people who come from immigrant families as well, wherever they, they might be from. Um, all right, next question. Um, in composing a large choral orchestral piece like She Will Transform You, do you work from beginning to end, or do you start with the chorus parts and then create the orchestral introduction and interludes afterwards? This was a very insightful question. Um, typically speaking, with large choir and orchestra works, I think of them as a singular thing. And then I will set the text. Sometimes I feel like maybe this line of text needs to be said and then there needs to be an interlude after it. And I think of it kind of as this holistic thing and then figure out how to best, um, best set the text. In this case, it was really interesting because just the way that the commission worked, the choir parts were due many months before the orchestra parts. And so what I ended up having to do is to write a choir piece and then actually add the orchestra in around it, which is why you see there are these large swaths of text and then there are these interludes and they feel, um, it kind of feels like maybe the interludes are different music or they're not quite as interspersed. Um, and uh, that was the only time I've ever had to do that. But what's fascinating is that the piece actually works as a choir only piece, but then it also works in a much longer form as a choir and orchestra piece, which most of my work, um, if it's for choir and orchestra, it would be choir and piano. There, there would have to be something else in there to, to um, take the orchestral parts. But in this case, the piece works either with orchestra or without orchestra. And I actually have a version of She Will Transform You that's for solo flute and, and choir. So um, yeah, this was a really unusual process, but most of the time I think of the text and then I write the I, I write the instruments kind of around and into and dovetailing with, with the choir parts. Um, okay, let's see. Next question by Adeline. 
Um, what's your favorite part of She Will Transform You, musically speaking? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's insightful because, um, yeah, I guess as composers, sometimes we do have favorite parts of our pieces. Um, I'll start by saying something that um, really challenged me about this particular piece. So as I mentioned before, a lot of my music works in Indian classical rags. And so a rag is basically it's like a scale in that you know you navigate it up and down in a specific way, but it also has a lot of other elements in it. So there's a lot of kind of aesthetic properties of it. There are very specific ways that you, specific phrases that you would do. They're associated with specific aesthetics and um, times of day and sometimes times of year. So there's just a lot more information in a rag than there would be in just a bare scale, like a major or minor scale. Um, and so in this case, the the sound of the this rag, which is called ragishri, um, the sound of it is da na 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 da 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 da. And it'll sound like I mean I'm singing it in a Western way, but ah 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 that's how you would navigate up and down. Um, so in our Western ear, and maybe some of you as you're thinking about this are thinking that the scale degrees are five, seven, one, three, four, five. It's not, it's one, three, four, six, seven, one. And that blew my mind because there's this whole group of Indian rags um, where it doesn't have a fifth in it. So our Western minds are hearing the tonic as five instead of as one. Um, and, you know, for those of you who are kind of theory buffs, you'll kind of immediately see what I'm saying, right? Um, so you never feel like you're home because when you're on one, your Western ears kind of think you're on five. And so this just baffled me to think, how do I write a piece that, that works here? And at the same time, it's actually exactly in line with what the meaning of the piece is which is this idea of where is home. <laughs> and so I will say that it was really hard for me to come up with phrases that I felt worked and that I felt still moved it forward in a Western way. Um, but one that I loved was, mm, it starts with homeland and then the phrase is, let this sweet child be. That was one phrase that I came up with right away and it just opens my heart every time. And um, I struggled with so many other things in this piece, but that one just felt like this plea and it felt like it was exactly what I wanted it to, um, what I wanted the musical effect to be. So yeah, I think I would say that was my favorite part of the piece. Um, all right, next question comes from Eli. What made you vary the tempo and the time signature in She Will Transform You? Um, that's a really good question. I think especially in pieces with text, my thought is always to make the text as clear as possible so that the, the singers feel like they can really communicate what the text is and the audience feels like they can understand it as best as possible. Um, and so I'm always singing through and trying to think what's the right tempo for this text? Maybe this needs a little bit more time. Maybe this needs a few more beats in between to let that line land and settle. Maybe I need to um, have this text kind of be layered on top of itself. Um, maybe I just need to repeat it once and wait. Um, so I'm always thinking first in terms of the text. And so sometimes the time signature, sometimes just the tempo will change a little bit because of that. And I think in performance, sometimes the the intended result, I can see that there's a lot more flexibility than the tempos I've given them there. So a lot of times um, conductors will take things faster or slower just because it reads really differently. Um, even in a specific room, it might read really differently uh, than in another room. So um, pacing, I think, is one of my big challenges as a composer because a lot of times when you're a performer, you know, your job is when you get on stage, you get up and you play 
the piece from the first note to the last note and you play it right in time. As a composer, I might spend a day or two days working on a couple seconds of music or a minute of music. And so my time scale is so different than a performer's time scale would be because you do have to really exist in real time in a way that, that I don't. So that's something that I always really struggle with is how is this piece going to pace, especially when text is involved. Um, Okay, last question from Matthew. Uh, would you encourage people considering composition as a career to pursue this goal? And if so, what advice would you give them? Yes, absolutely. If you feel that it's in you to compose, I mean, please, <laughs> grace us with your music. That I, I, I would always encourage anyone who wants to compose to just try their hand at it and um, get as far as you can. And learning to compose is just like learning a new language. Um, you can use it in so many ways in your life. You don't necessarily have to be a professional composer if you don't want to, but it's just learning to find what your language and your style of communication is can only be a, a good thing. And so I would say, um, if I had to give you a few little nuggets of advice, I would say, number one, be really honest about what you like and don't like. Because remember, I think when we're when we're trained as musicians, we're trained to say, well, this music is supposed to be great music, so we have to like it. Or maybe this music is a little bit like guilty pleasure listening and you know, we, we can't really admit that we like this piece. And there's a lot of hierarchy around what we like and why. And one thing that really helped me as I was developing my own style is to be really honest about the kind of music that I liked and the kind of music I didn't. And that doesn't mean that I can't respect music that I don't necessarily like to listen to or that I can't learn a lot about how a piece is crafted or about why a composer made the decisions they did. But I think when you're composing, you have to be clear on um, what it is that really moves you and what kind of music you want to bring into the world um, for your own sake. And then the other thing I would say is, at this age especially, um, you're all young and I would say that it's really important to make friends with people who share your values. Um, I think it's sometimes really tempting to figure out, okay, who's the performer who's winning the competitions? Who's the person who seems like they're going to have this big career and go really far and maybe I should kind of, you know, be friends with them. Um, but you're still all very young and it's really hard to know where people are going and what the trajectory uh, they'll have is. But I will say that when I was in high school and junior high, and, um, when I was, you know, a teenager, I made friends with people who I just wanted to go the distance with. You know, maybe they weren't as um, adept as they are now, but because we shared the same values, we were able to build things together and then we were able to encourage one another to grow. And I think you can't create music in a vacuum. You need other people. If you're a composer, you need performers. If you're, you know, maybe if you're a, a soloist, you need an accompanist or vice versa. Um, it's really important to uh, find the people who you want to go the distance with. And I found that in the last couple decades of my career, um, a lot of my closest collaborators have been people who I've known for a very long time or who I met at a time where all we had was our shared values and we kind of built things from there. So I hope this was helpful um, and I hope you're really enjoying performing She Will Transform You and I, I can't wait to hear it.